for NHRA drag racing. If you plan to qualify at an NHRA national event, bring your horsepower. Since Kenny Bernstein became the 16th member of the Four Second Club two years ago, elapsed times have steadily improved. The result is a milestone cross today in which an entire 16-car field in top fuel eliminator has qualified at times under five seconds. Where does all of this improvement come from? Good old American-style innovation, a pump builder with a better idea for delivering fuel, or rod, block, and piston manufacturers making their parts just a little bit stronger. Add talented crew chiefs able to put the pieces together and top fuel dragsters go quicker. That's not to say that it is easy to qualify quick and fast. Just ask Joe Amato. Yet after incorporating the best parts, working with the best crew and judging the intangibles like weather and track conditions, reality says that half of the combatants in the quickest field in history will lose each round. The pride of having participated in on-track history only partly soothing the pain of packing it up early. Today, the $18 million 18 event Winston Championship Drag Racing Series stops in Houston, Texas at Houston Raceway Park for the third event on the tour, the sixth annual Slick 50 Nationals. Welcome to Houston Raceway Park. You, along with literally tens of thousands of fans, have jammed into this facility to take in one great drag race, and the action has already started. Hi, everybody. I'm Dave McClellan, and it was in the first round of Top Fuel qualifying on Saturday that Don Prudhomme made a picture-perfect run. 4.86 seconds was his elapsed time, but more importantly, his speed. The third member of the 300-mile-an-hour club from Slick 50, 301.60. Don Prudhomme was a happy man. Oh, oh out of sight. <laughs> man, I just, all I do is hope to get down to the end, and I'm just glad we're one of the ones to do it. You know, we, we've searched for it and worked hard for it, and John Mellon, the whole Skull Bandit crew, I just can't say enough for him. Thank you very much. Certainly not all of the excitement and action was concentrated in Top Fuel Eliminator. For the story of what's going on in funny car racing, here's my good pal Steve Evans. Thank you, Dave. At the risk of sounding like a commodities broker, I have the highs and the lows in funny car qualifying. No question about the high. It involved this car driven by John Force, a brand new world record elapsed time of 5.061. Now, to make it official, though, he has to back it up within 1% of 511 to get the bonus 200 points. I don't like his chances of doing that in the hot weather today unless he can get to the final round when it cools off. All in all, a tremendous performance for Force. No question about the low either. Japanese national Kenji Okazaki. Watch this. 1,200 feet. The engine explodes and the car becomes up. Well, the pictures speak for themselves. Kenji was unhurt, but as you might imagine, just a little bit shaken by his first such experience. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, uh... I was just ready to uh, shut off just before the first try, and, and I just saw the fire come out. Boom! That's it. I couldn't see anything after that. Car owner Big Jim Dunn, a longtime driver himself, surveyed the wreckage and uh, had these comments. Uh, it just looked like it laid over about halfway down, and uh, that's what I told him. I said, you're going to have to burn a couple times to get the experience knowing what a motor laying over does. And uh, So now he's got that experience. We'll build another one. And go. But it'll take him a year to get all the burns and scars everybody else earns. you got to earn it. You can't buy it. Thank you. Equally exciting was the pro stock qualifying, and here's Bob Fry. Thanks, Steve. Well, nobody loved the conditions here at Houston Raceway Park much more than the pro stockers as everybody turned in career best in the 16-car field. They took to the track and the atmosphere conditions here at Houston Raceway Park like a duck takes to water. And nobody enjoyed the conditions any more than Warren Johnson. Warren first came up and put a 7.05 up on the scoreboard and then under ideal conditions on Friday night lowered the national record to an unbelievable 7.02. As a matter of fact, that mark was even a little bit too quick for WJ because we actually wanted to, to just move it down just a little bit. A 707, 705 would have been uh, really a, a little bit more to our liking for the fact that conceivably there's two more tracks that the record could be set at this year. 702 is going to be awful tough to beat, even by us. I, it's just virtually impossible, I think. 
just to put this 16-car record-setting field into its proper perspective, every car that qualified here at Houston Raceway Park this weekend bettered the previous track record. Thanks, Bob Fry. What a great day of racing we have in store in all three of our professional classes. We're at Houston Raceway Park just outside of Baytown, Texas for the sixth annual running of the Slick 50 Nationals. And you're looking at Mike Dunn at the wheel of Daryl Gwynn's La Victoria Salsa Special. Dunn, the new driver for the 1993 season. His competition here in round number two is Rance McDaniel. Coming into this, the third race of the season, Joe Amato's got the lead in the Winston Point standings, followed by Eddie Hill, Kenny Bernstein, Corey Mack, and Duck Herbert rounds out the top five. 18 races make up the Winston Championship Series for 93. This is Jerry Gwynn, Daryl's dad, serving as the team manager. Daryl this season has taken over the crew chief role on this car. He also is calling all the shots. Rance McDaniel drives the TFX 92 entry. That acronym stands for the engine developed by John Rodak. It is a pure race motor designed for one thing, and that is to cover the quarter mile as quick as possible. This engine burst onto the racing scene at the middle of the season last year, and since then has propelled a number of drivers to record-shattering performances. Based on their first round performances, this could be a close race. Only a thousandth of a second difference separated the two. McDaniel had a 4.907. 4.908 was the first round time for Mike Dunn. Dunn is set on the starting line. McDaniel just a few inches away. A green light start for both drivers. And Dunn falters at the finish line, and McDaniel squirts ahead. Look at that, an identical elapsed time. 4.907, this time his speed over 294. Let's go to the starting line, and here's Bob Fry. Not an easy field, that's a tough one to get by. Yeah, maybe our luck's changed today. That new engine seems to be really running well for you guys this year. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Improvement. A 490, that's a pretty strong improvement. They go on to the semifinals. Bob, if consistency is the key to winning races, then the rest of the top fuel field better look out for Rance McDaniel. Back-to-back -back 490s. Dunn got a bit of an advantage, as we see here in this instant replay, but it was all McDaniel from half-track on as the La Victoria car in the far lane started falling off just a little bit, and the TFX 92 entry of McDaniel crossed the finish line first. Let's go to the far end and Steve Evans. Well, that looked like a pretty good old car race for about the first three quarters of the racetrack. Yeah, sure. It was a lovely car race. 490 for you. Not bad. The car runs a lot of 490s. Yeah, it's all it knows. 490s. We're going to get a little better. Okay. You're having fun. You haven't been back but, what, a year and a half now and starting to win some rounds. Oh, this is great. Yeah, you bet. We're here to stay. All right. We'll be following your progress, Rance. If Rance can find that improvement, watch out for the McDaniel team. Here comes Kenny Bernstein. His competition, none other than Ed McCulloch. That's Dale Armstrong, his crew chief, out directing traffic. Bernstein got a big break in round one. He used a whole shot starting line advantage to defeat Shelly Anderson. They both turned identical elapsed times to the thousands. The competition is Ed McCulloch at the wheel of the McDonald's dragster, owned by Larry Miner. McCulloch is the number one qualifier. His big break came in the first round when Corey McLennathan red-lighted for the third race in a row. McCulloch recorded a 4.87 second elapsed time. That gives him the lane choice over Bernstein, who had a 4.91 in his battle with Shelley Anderson. Bernstein had qualified at a 4.87. That was only good for the number eight spot in this incredible record-shattering field. You're on board with Kenny Bernstein and the Budweiser King. He's lined up in the far side of the racetrack. McCulloch here in the lane nearest the camera. Bernstein's got the advantage off the starting line and problem set in a flash of flame and a lot of smoke and McCulloch wins it. His elapsed time only a 4.99 at 291. He was definitely vulnerable, but Bernstein could not take advantage. Bob Fry? This is not an easy field, and I don't think a 499 would have won that prior to that round. Well, I'll tell you, it dropped a cylinder. You know, it's warming up out here. The conditions have changed dramatically from qualifying, so we'll probably have to put a little bit more of a tune-up on it to run in this kind of conditions. The car's going to slow down then next round? No, I don't think so. We'll need to step up next round. Thank you. It's either step up or step out in this program. Bob, nobody's better at finding those step-up improvements than Lee Beard. 
Watch this race. McCullough got a very slight advantage on the Christmas tree, but Bernstein's performance instantly pulled him out to the lead until the middle of the racetrack. And then when problems set in for Bernstein, the motor let go. There was a flash of flame. A lot of oil came out of it. And McCulloch streaked on to a 499 victory. Let's go to Steve. Well, the beer car blew up, and the burger car slowed way down to a 499. Well, I don't know really what happened, but uh, I know that this McDonald's car is going into the next round, and that's all that counts right now. Looked like it was going to be a real good drag race. You guys never let us down, but he had some big problems. Well, like I said, you know, I couldn't tell what he did. I did see him out there in front of me for a little while, and then it, you know, it went away. But uh, we'll be we'll be back and ready for next round. This is the second McDonald's dragster, and this one is driven by Tony Pendragon. His competition here in round number two is Scott Coletta, second generation racer out of the Coletta Flying Services sponsorship. For Pedragon, his car owner, Larry Miner, takes an active role in this car. That's Miner right there checking to see the status of Coletta. Pedragon qualified very well in the number seven spot and won his first round race over Jimmy Nix. For Scott Coletta, career performances coming here at Houston. 484 in qualifying. Tremendous. That put him in the number two spot. And he beat Tommy Johnson Jr. in the first round with a 485 to earn lane choice here. Coletta now using former Winston champ Dick LaHaye as his crew chief. Both drivers ever so cautious into the staging beams. And what looks to be a huge advantage for Tony Pendragon is in reality a loss. A red light. Anything less than perfect, 0 .400 in reaction time, is a red light. And as you can see, he was close, but that really doesn't count much when you come to drag racing. Here's the Team Valvoline car, the five-time Winston champion, Joe Amato. His crew chief, Jeff Rogers, sprinting out to get Joe underway with his burnout procedure. His competition, Doug Herbert at the wheel of the Hugger Sportswear Machine. Right after the U.S. Nationals at Indy last year, when longtime crew chief Tim Richards and Joe Amato went their separate ways, it was Doug Herbert that stepped up, offered his combination in his crew chief, Jim Brissett. That assistance aided Joe Amato in winning his Winston title. But right now, it's all-out war. Amato qualified here with an elapsed time of a 491, not what he had hoped for. In qualifying up against Jimmy Nix, he had nothing but problems. Watch these dramatic pictures from our onboard camera. Boom goes Amato, boom goes Nix. Both great balls of fire. The flying debris and the heat off of Joe Amato's engine blew the left rear tire. It scraped to a stop on the skids. Steve was there. The bad thing, he blew up too and he was throwing parts at me. So I saw a piece of connecting rod and I kind of like trying to steer it even though I couldn't steer it to get out of the way so I wouldn't get hit in the head with his parts or hurt my car. But, uh, you know, one of them deals. Amato was able to repair, qualified on his last effort for the number 12 spot in round number one. He met the newest member of the 300 mile an hour club, Don Prudhomme, and pulled out a squeaker based on his driving ability alone. Prudhomme, shower of sparks out of the clutch can, had the quicker elapsed time of 490. Amato had the quicker reaction time and a 491 won it, bringing him here to round number two, where he squares off against Doug Herbert, who qualified at a 485. Remember, Herbert at Pomona this year was the second driver in history to go over the 300 mile an hour mark. Amato with a big lead. And oh no, engine problems again for Amato, and Herbert squeaked by for the win, 489 at over 298. That moves him to the semifinals, and our Winston points leaders out of competition. Bob? Jim, another great performance, 489, and boy, that car runs in high gear. Yeah, we were trying to repeat, because Amato obviously is the same combination we got, and you know, he's... Uh, we were lucky, you know. It looks like he's died right at the finish line. I think it was pretty close. I have to watch TV and see, but it looked like it was pretty close to me. But fortunately, we got there first. <laughs> Word still has it. That car might have another 300 in it this weekend. Well, actually, we riched it up a little bit because we were, yeah, we'll see next run. <laughs> we'll all see next run if that car can run over 300 again. Jim Brissett with the combination in both cars knew he had a challenge on his hands. Amato rose to the occasion with nearly three hundredths of a second advantage right off the starting line. But once again, engine problems slowed the car at the finish line and Herbert was able to come past for a 489 victory. Incredible performances yielded by this quarter mile racetrack.
here at Houston Raceway Park. Well, our pairings for the semifinals finds Doug Herbert against the low qualifier, Ed McCulloch, and Doug's got the lane choice based on his performance in round number two. Scott Coletta and Rance McDaniel duel it out, and McDaniel gets to pick his lane against Scotty. Now, let's go to the far end. Here again, Steve. Well, Doug, wins over Joe Amato are few and far between for anybody. Hey, he's not the world champ for nothing, you know. Anytime you beat him, you better remember it because it might not happen very often. In a nice 489 for the time of day. Hey, 489, I'll tell you what, it's hot out here right now. He was, he was running good. He was pulling away from me there, and then about 1,000 foot, uh, I came past him. Hey, he's got a good tune-up on that car, you know. Not quite good enough this time. Not quite good. The fuse wasn't long enough. I think I was close to him. We were side by side, and then the, something happened. I think it picked a rod out of it, but... Uh... And Doug's a good guy. I hope he goes on to win the race now, buddy. Yeah, buddy. You always want the guy that beats you to win the race. Always. Steve, not only did Top Fuel qualify with the quickest field in history, so did Pro Stock. And that's what's coming up next from Houston Raceway Park. This is Paul Rebeshi, Jr. driving the Pontiac Grand Prix. His competition, Jerry Haas, the chassis builder, he's at the wheel of one of his own creations, an Osmobile Cutlass. The competition in pro stock extremely tight. Warren Johnson leading coming into this race, followed by Mark Powick. Scott Jeffrey on third. Warren's son, Kurt, is fourth. And Larry Morgan rounds out the top five. That's coming into Houston. Paul Rebeshi utilizing the Pontiac Grand Prix body. Owns a construction company that sponsors his racing efforts. Jerry Haas uses competition as a rolling test bed. Haas upset the number three qualifier, Kurt Johnson, in the first round when Johnson had problems. Meantime, Paul Rebeshi used a whole shot to defeat Bruce Allen in his Chevrolet. Here now, they are meeting in round number two with Rebeshi holding the lane choice based on his 720 in the first round compared to Haas's 725. As we've already seen in top fuel racing, the start can be all important and maybe even just a bit more so here in pro stock because it is difficult to find that burst of high gear power that will propel you past the deficit you may have lost with a poor reaction time. Haas in the lane nearest the camera, and Haas leaves the red light. He knew he had to take a shot at Rebeshi. He also got almost across the center line. Rebeshi goes across and advances to the semifinals with a 718 at over 191 miles an hour. Jerry Haas knowing he was back a little bit in performance based on round number one competition. Tried to take a shot at the tree, and you see right there that big red light glowing. That indicates he was disqualified for leaving the starting line too soon. Here's the bright purple machine. This is Larry Morgan at the wheel of the Castrol Super Clean car. Larry qualified on his last attempt with a 714. That only put him in the number 12 spot. Steve? It's always nice to talk to Paul Rebeshi. We don't get to do it enough. A nice 718, buddy. Good. That was great. We needed that real bad. Uh, we've got to really owe this a lot to my uh, crew chief, Bob Rich, Bob Ingalls, my wife, my family. Uh, they've been very supportive, and uh, we're real pleased to be going to the semi here at the Houston Slick 50 Nationals. Can you get some more out of it? Because you're probably going to need it if you run into that Oldsmobile Johnson. I think we could. It felt like it slipped the clutch pretty good, so we, I think there's a little bit more left in it. All right. 191 miles an hour. Great. Paul Rebeshi obviously pleased with his performance thus far. Larry Morgan won his first round race based on a hole shot, defeating David Rampey. Rusty Glidden is Morgan's competition. Glidden at the wheel of the Motorcraft Ford Probe had a great run in round number one when he defeated the leading champion, Mark Powick. Now it is Ford versus Oldsmobile once again. Into the staging beam. RPM's up, and Morgan again off the starting line first. A close drag race, and by a matter of inches, Larry Morgan pulls it out. The winning time for Morgan, 7.20. The losing time for Glidden, 7.18. Watch in replay. The car nearest the camera is the one that moves first and gets the advantage more than enough to hold off a two hundredths of a second better elapsed time by the car in the far lane. Glidden was giving it everything he had, but these were two very equally matched cars and he just ran out of racetrack before he could run him down. 7.20 at 190, losing time 7.18 at 191, eight thousandths of a second difference. <laughs> Rusty Glidden is down here yelling, did I win? <laughs> 
Yeah, no reason for him to be here, actually. We used to call Come you Come on over here. We used to call you Mr. Happy. Now you're Mr. Whole Shot. Your 20 beat his 18. I knew I was going to have to drive. This kid's been driving his... I mean, he is so bad. I had to do something. <laughs> you didn't know you'd lost, did you? Uh-uh. Plus, he put me in the bad lane. That's not fair, Russell. That's why they get lane choice, Larry. I know that. I hope I can get that next, next time. He may need more than a 720 to get lane choice in the semifinals. Scott Coletta looking on intently as his crew, headed up by former Winston champ Dick LaHaye, prepares his top fuel dragster for something better, he hopes, than his second round confrontation when he went up in smoke right off the starting line. This is Houston Raceway Park, located just east of Baytown, Texas, and it is jammed with fans today that are thrilled by the performances they're watching. Here in the near lane, the Dynamax Pontiac. This is Jim Yates at the wheel, his competition, the number two qualifier, the Motorcraft Ford Probe, and the patriarch of the Glidden Racing family, Bob Glidden at the wheel. Only Warren Johnson has run quicker than Bob Glidden this weekend. He qualified at a 707 and had a first-round victory over Brad Klein. Meantime, Yates had qualified at a 7.13 and beat a troubled Scott Jeffreyon in his first-round confrontation. Glidden has the lane choice here in round number two. He ran 7.16 in his first-round race. Both of the Fords are running very well. Rusty Glidden losing only by a hole shot just a few moments ago. Now Glidden has got to gather together his concentration as he bumps the car into the staging beam. He's up against the line lock, releases it when the green light comes on, and the race is underway. The advantage at the starting line went to Yates, but at the finish line, it is all Glidden. Another 7.16, this time at over 192 miles an hour, advancing Bob Glidden into the semifinals. Exactly four hundredths of a second advantage went to Jim Yates off the starting line. He knew he needed every bit of it, but he did not know that he needed more because Bob Glidden was able to outperform him. The elapsed time difference was five hundredths of a second, so the margin of victory at the finish line going to Bob Glidden was exactly ten thousandths of a second, or one one hundredth. That's what it looks like in terms of distance. At the starting line, our next pair ready to go. Here's your number one qualifier, the GM Performance Parts Osmobile, Warren Johnson, up against the Conoco Pontiac, driven by Ricky Smith. Both drivers with new sponsors. Steve? The younger Glidden got punted out of here on a hole shot, but not Pops. <laughs> You're still around with another 716. Well, I saw in front of me that Rusty lost, but, uh, you know, anything can happen in this race, and Steve, it's really close. 716, though this car is right on that number every round, it seems. Well, uh, we're going to have to run quicker than 716 to get by another round. Uh, I think we run Rubishi. He went 18, I believe, and uh, he's been kind of closing his eyes and letting the clutch out, so anything can happen. Hey, if it works, why argue with success? Warren Johnson knows what works. 702, a new national record. 195 miles an hour plus, a new national record. But he's got to be concerned about Ricky Smith because the playbook on Smith says he's noted for his reaction times. Warren, though, with an incredible performance advantage over the rest of the field with the exception of Bob Glidden. 500 cubic inch maximum displacement. 2,350 pounds with the driver on board. That's the minimum weight they run on racing gasoline through carburetors. And look at the lead that Smith's got. Johnson was not able to make it up. Ricky Smith pulls off the upset of the race, laying away the number one qualifier and new national record holder. Let's take a look at the times. 717 at 191, the winning effort, the losing effort, a 711. Nearly seven hundredths of a second advantage right off the starting line. Six hundredths of a second advantage going in the performance to Warren Johnson. When you get to the finish line, that makes a margin of victory of only eight thousandths of a second. So narrow, it's hard to pick up even on the stop action camera. 
Moving to the semifinal round, Ricky Smith will challenge Larry Morgan. Now there's two whole shot artists that are going to battle it out, while the other side of the ladder finds Paul Rebeshi Jr. trying to match his skills against the 10-time Winston champion, Bob Glidden. Let's go to the far end of the racetrack and Steve Evans. Ricky Smith almost drove off on me. You won. Oh, man, I tell you, thank God got across the center line with me. It got pretty loose down there, but, you know, WJ's been beating on me a long time. It's about time we pit him out. These numbers are a little hard to believe. Your 17 beat his 11. Yeah, well, you know, I beat him almost a tenth at, at Englishtown. He drove around me by 1,000th last year, so, you know, we're due to finally beat the guy. You know, he's a hard racer. Ever since you started wearing those glasses, you've been trickier than ever. Hey, ever since we wore these glasses, I've had good life. <laughs> Thank you. As we pick up action here in round number two, this is Chuck Etchells and the Nobody Beats the Wiz Dodd. After long discussions, Etchells and the crew decided to compete here. They had qualified so well with Maynard's tune-up at a 5.16. They decided to go ahead and race, and in round one, ran a 5.14 elapsed time. That gives him lane choice over the Winston champion, Cruz Pedregon, at the wheel of the McDonald's Osmobile, who was able to run a 5.15. Pedregon had qualified with a 514, good for the number four spot, and came into this race in the Winston points lead, followed by John Force, Del Worsham, Al Hoffman in fourth, and Jim Epler rounded out the top five coming into Houston. But for the Etchells crew, it was truly an emotional moment. In memory of Maynard Yanks on the side of the race car, Etchells and the crew continuing on in competition, and they know this is what Maynard would have wanted. For Pedregon, his performance here, not quite what they had hoped for. As the team, headed up by new crew chief Mike Green, was looking for some of those 5-0s that they closed out last year with. Remember, John Force is already in the 5-0s, that record-shattering 506, but he still needs the required 1% backup to make it an official record. Etchells is in the near lane. Pedregon in the far lane. Cruz, the defending champion here. This was the first race he ever won as a funny car driver. It came one year ago on this same quarter mile racetrack. Into the pre-stage beams, the drivers, when that top light on the tree comes on, is about six inches away from the actual starting line. A tremendous race, and by a little over a car length, as Larry Minor car owner watches on, Cruz Pedregon advances to the semifinals. Times 522 with a 5 for Pedregon. For Etchells, 522 with a 5. Incredibly close racing. We're watching here at Houston Raceway Park, but the margin of victory was the reaction time advantage gained by Pedregon at the starting line. And as you can see in our replay, he had a big lead by the time they had reached the eighth of a mile mark and Etchells could not find the performance to drive back around him. So now, Pedregon into the semis. Back at the starting line, crew chief Tom Anderson, along with Al's wife, Helen, directing Hoffman into the proper spot. A couple of weeks ago, the looks on their faces considerably different. Here we take a look back as Al Hoffman was in the near lane, John Ford was in the far lane, this was at the Buttercraft Nationals and more dramatic pictures from inside John Force's car. Now he got a chance to see what he has looked like to so many other drivers. Hoffman exploded the engine in the lights on that winning run, but in a brilliant driving job, kept the car under control, drove it off the racetrack at the end and came out of the cloud of smoke under his own power. Amazingly, through that intense inferno, Hoffman was uninjured in the incident. But for the car, nearly a total loss, necessitating his switch to last year's racer, his backup car, and you see on the side his tribute to the NHRA Safety Safari. Problems for Tom Hoover. The engine lets go as Hoffman streaks across the finish line into the semis. A 518 at 285. Incredible performances. He had a 513 in round number one. Let's take a look back and see what happened to Hoover. He got near the center line. The car was kind of spitting some flames out early, and then a flash of fire indicating his problems severe. Steve? Well, for Al Hoffman, this new car is right on track, a 518. Yeah, we're looking to stay right in that range there. Maybe step it up a little bit for the final if we can get in there. After the horrible fire in Phoenix, do you put that out of your mind completely when you get near that finish line? Are you holding your breath or anything like that? No, nah, that was years ago. Uh, it was only a it was week. It two weeks ago. All right. 
seems like years ago now. I want to keep it back there. Uh, BDS Dodge Daytona uh, is doing a great job out here. I'd like to thank Bill Jeter for putting on a great race at the Slick 50 Nationals here. we got great weather for it and a lot of good fans. Here's your national record holder, but he still hasn't backed it up. John Force at the wheel of the Castrol Oldsmobile, and you're riding on board. Our in-car camera showing John giving us a wave. Look at the shield that John has constructed over the steering wheel. This was a device that he came up with a year ago to help protect his hands in case of a fire. Here is the new Roland Leong entry, the Hawaiian Vacation Dodge driven by Gordy Bonnet. Here's one of the crew chiefs on John Force's car. This is Bernie Federley playing traffic cop for the moment as Austin Coyle, the head wrench, dives underneath the body to make a final few adjustments. This is standard operating procedure. Here is Roland Leong, one of the true legends of this sport. His new sponsor, the Hawaiian Tourism Industry, backing the Hawaiian Vacation Dodge. This is a rejoining of a team, Gordy Bonin and Roland Leong, that was competitive back in 1973 when Gordy was driving for Roland at that time. Roland's been out of this sport now for over a year. Remember, it was Jim White at the wheel of a Roland Leong car that was running over 293 miles an hour some two seasons ago. Now Roland is called on Leonard Hughes, formerly of Candies and Hughes, to serve as crew chief on this operation. You're on board with John Force. A tremendously close race, and Force pulls it out right in the last few feet. Look at the elapsed times. Force winning it at a 5.15. Bonin losing it at a 5.13. Bob Fry? Boy, shades of Pomona all over again. The driver just keeps getting better, Austin. Well, that's true. He earned his keep there with a bit of a hole shot. The car's running pretty hard, too. It was in a little on the deep side, and it dropped a cylinder again. We've been fighting that now that it's warming up here. As we watch and replay, what a performance by both teams. For Bonin, what a debut. He failed to qualify, actually came in as the alternate for Kenji Okazaki after Okazaki's disastrous fire during qualifying. And here he gave John Force almost more than the two-time Winston champion could handle. Look at this. As they neared the finish line, Force was able to drive around only by that margin and take the win. This is Jason Minio. He is the crew chief for his dad, Gordon Minio. Flash Gordon coming back from a disaster a month ago. It was at Pomona, California that Gordon Minio exploded the Firebird Formula car into a ball of fire. He came out of it okay. They had a new body on it two weeks ago in Phoenix, and now it's all painted up. And meeting Brent Fanning here in round number two. Gordon remembers this racetrack well. It was the site of his best ever performance. He finished runner-up to Cruz Pedregon one year ago. Video with the advantage off the starting line problem. And a fire breaks out. Another blazing inferno for Minio. It is continuing to burn as he deploys the parachutes and brings the car to a stop on the racetrack. You see the NHRA safety safari rolling from the far end of the track as Gordon still inside the race car. The emergency hatch comes open. And there's Gordon Menio climbing out under his own power. Gordon runs around to the front of the car and it looks like he's trying to raise the body. But the heat has already gotten to the composite and his efforts are to no avail. Let's take a look at this one again in replay. Fanning was in the far lane. He went on to victory, but the attention was definitely focused on Gordon Minio. Had a good run going, and then something goes wrong. As the smoke begins to come from the back of the car, you see the trail of oil coming out of it, indicating an engine failure, and the car flashed into flame. He battled it, keeping it in his own lane all the way down the racetrack until he was able to get the parachutes out and on the brake hard enough to bring the car to a safe stop and exit the vehicle under his own power. That's the reason for that emergency hatch that is built into these sleek aerodynamic bodies to give the driver an opportunity to exit a burning race car without anybody having to get in there and raise the body to allow him to come out under a normal configuration. Steve? Well, you have to start wondering how much one family can handle. Gordon Minio, the second race out of three, we find you at the ambulance taking oxygen. This is just horrible. I can't keep rods in it. Every time I step on it, it's over. 
Thank God for the safety factors built into this automobile. At least we're talking. Yeah, I understand that, but I'm getting sick of this deal. I tell you, I got to do something quick. <laughs> we hope you find it. You can not only hear but see the stress and the disappointment experienced by Gordon Minio. Here's the pairings for the semifinals. Al Hoffman will get to pick his lane over the surprising Brent Fanning, while the other side of the ladder finds, oh, what a battle here. John Force and Cruz Pedragon duking it out with Force having the lane choice. We're at Houston Raceway Park in the semifinals of Top Fuel Eliminator at the Slick 50 Nationals. I'm Dave McClelland along with Steve Evans and Bob Fry, and we're having one great drag race. McDaniel is in the near lane. Both drivers sitting in the pre-stage beams, getting their thoughts concentrated on cutting the best light they can. And it went to Coletta, the battle off the starting line, all Scott. But at the finish, just by a few inches, Rance McDaniel drives around him a 491 at 291 miles an hour. Remember, McDaniel's run 490, 490, and now a 491. Watch again in replay. Huge advantage going to Coletta. Seven hundredths of a second. Picked up a couple of three feet the moment he stood on the throttle but he was unable to hold off the charge as Coletta was forced to slow to only 273 miles an hour as he went into the traps. You see the raw fuel coming out of the motor indicating something went wrong on the race car. The infrared beams that stretch across the starting line are broken by the front tires as they roll into those beams. And Herbert smokes the tires. McCulloch into the finals. Oh, the elapsed time back again, 487. Speed over 298 miles an hour. It will be McCulloch and McDaniel in the finals. Bob? Lee, a 487 is going to give you lane choice in the finals. Is that a difference on this racetrack? Well, it didn't seem to be. We've run 80s on both sides of this track. You know, the McDonald's cars just performed flawlessly all weekend long from both sides, so we don't really think there's much of an advantage. It's been a long while since somebody came off of the number one qualifying position to win one of these things. You guys thinking about that? Well, this is an awfully strong race car, an excellent driver, and a terrific crew. All the elements are there. We're now into the semifinals of Pro Stock Eliminator. Here comes the purple car. This is the super clean Oldsmobile and Larry Morgan doing the driving. Morgan knows he is going to have to find not only some quick reaction times, he's already used that twice just to make it to the semifinals, but some power as well. As Smith and his Conoco Pontiac is running very well, but they don't call him Tricky Ricky for nothing. This is truly one of the accomplished levers in this sport. But the way that Morgan's been driving today, you could rank him right up alongside a Ricky. The burnouts are completed. These cars equipped with either four-speed or five-speed transmissions. Some shifted by pulling a lever, others simply by pushing a button. But it's quite a handful. Both drivers set, and it's Morgan out first. Across the finish line first for the third consecutive round. Morgan wins by a whole shot. His elapsed time, a 719 at 191. The losing elapsed time, 718. You live by the sword, you sometimes die by that same sword. And that's what happened to Ricky Smith. He got tricked at the starting line as Morgan drilled him on the Christmas tree. Look at the Oldsmobile pull ahead in the early stages of this race. And even though Smith was able to make up some of it, he could not overcome the big advantage. And by nearly six hundredths of a second, Larry Morgan crossed the finish line first. Well, in the near lane, Paul Rebeshi Jr. being directed into the proper spot on the starting line. This is one of those Ford versus GM battles. And on paper, it shapes up as a pretty good one. Glidden in the Motorcraft Probe had a 7.16 in his round number two victory, while Rebeshi had a 7.18 to advance here to the semifinals. But remember, early in our program, Glidden described Rebeshi's current driving style as closing his eyes and letting the clutch out. May have been partly in jest, but Glidden is hoping that that's the case because he's going to need every advantage he can get. 
right now he got the big one because Rameshi left the red light at the starting line and Bob Glidden goes into the final round his elapsed time 714 what does that mean that means he's going to pick his lane against Larry Morgan in the final round of Pro Stock Eliminator as we watch this race again in instant replay, you can see that Rapeshi on the right-hand side of your screen wasn't even close to cutting a good light. Based on his elapsed time of a 7.23, even if he had cut a perfect light, he still could not have defeated Glidden. So that sets up our final. Glidden against Morgan, and Bobby gets to pick the lane. Perfect weather conditions have prevailed this entire weekend for the Slick 50 Nationals, and here we find Brent Fanning in the utter car up against Al Hoffman in the semifinals of Funny Car Eliminator. Quite a challenge for Fanning. He's never made it this far in national event competition, and who does he have to challenge but the number two qualifier and the only other car other than John Force to run in the 5-0s all weekend long. Who are we talking about? Al Hoffman, of course, at the wheel of the blower drive service, Dodge Daytona. The utter car Brent Fanning against the blower drive service, Dodge Daytona, driven by Al Hoffman. Should Fanning win this race, it would literally be the upset of the decade or more. But unfortunately, the cream did not rise to the top as Al Hoffman moves into the finals at a 518 at 269 miles an hour. His competition yet to be decided. Bob? Tommy, a conservative run there? Yes, very much so. We're, uh, we're racing for the world championship and every round of 200 points might help us at the end. Uh, we weren't really going for lane choice. We'll, if we lose it, we lose it. We'll win in a bad line. This is the race everybody came to Houston to see. On board with John Force in the Castro Osmobile and in the other lane, the McDonald's Osmobile of Cruz Pedregon. What a battle these two waged through the last half of the season a year ago, with Cruz prevailing to win the Winston Championship. And Cruz leaves too early. It's a red light start, and look at the elapsed time. He didn't back it up. He obliterated the 506 with the quickest time ever recorded by a funny car, 504, at over 294 miles an hour, the fastest speed ever. Bob Fry, you guys just keep getting better every run, and 04 is unbelievable. Well, like I said, this new combination we're working on has got a lot of potential, and when she's got eight cylinders, she's what we need. Hard to think about what the potential may be as Force goes into the finals with Lane Joyce with the quickest and fastest time ever, an unreal 5.04. As we move into the late afternoon hours here at Houston Raceway Park, we're set for the finals in our professional categories, kicking things off Pro Stock Eliminator, the Ford versus GM battle ensues again in the far lane. The Motorcraft probe of Bob Glidden in the near lane. Larry Morgan and his Castrol Super Clean Oldsmobile. The Cutlass driver is trying to make it four rounds in a row of whole shot victories. His crew chief Tom Roberts with one more task to perform and that is to position Morgan exactly where he wants him on the starting line. Billy Glidden, that's Bob's older son, who is now an accomplished competition eliminator driver at the wheel of a Ford Thunderbird, performing the same task for his dad, Bob. On paper, Glidden has got the advantage. Performance-wise, he was the number two qualifier, second only to Warren Johnson as far as elapsed times go at this event. In this round matchup, he had a 7.14 in the semis, while Morgan was 500s of a second slower. Again, the advantage off the starting line could spell the difference either way. The RPMs begin to build. At about 7,500 to 8,000, they dump the clutch and Glidden's out first. And Glidden from starting line to finish line comes home the champion. For 21 consecutive seasons, Bob has won an NHRA national event title. Here he did it with a great reaction time. 
four hundredths of a second quicker off the starting line than Morgan. Look at that. Glidden was out quick. By the time they had reached the 60-foot mark, he had several feet advantage over Morgan and continued to extend it. He outperformed him on the track as well. Compare the elapsed time. 7.13 to a 7.14. Glidden was also faster in speed. 193 to 192. Steve? Can't ask for a better pro stock final than that. I think it was pretty great. Steve. <laughs> Two different makes. 713 to a 714. I'll tell you, we're just tickled to death to be here. And I know Larry feels the same way about it. Tell me about the race. I don't oh, I think I won the race. That's I all. I know that. <laughs> you tell me about the race, Morgan. <laughs> I guess I didn't win. <laughs> 13 to a 14. You've picked way up. I, I must have made a super clean run anyhow. He's probably cheating. <laughs> if he picked up that much, he's probably cheating. No, he's cheating if he won. <laughs> he's the only one they're going to check. Thank you, Bob. Great start. Larry. Third race of the year belongs to Bob Glidden. 83 national event victories to the winningest driver in all of drag racing, Bob Glidden. Moved him to fourth in the Winston points chase behind Johnson, Morgan, Powick, and Kurt Johnson. Warren Sun drops to fifth. You're inside John Force's race car, and you see the red light by Al Hoffman. Force has won it. And look at the time of 5.05. Incredible performances by John Force, your Slick 50 Nationals champion. Bob? Austin Coyle, John Force, and the gang. Now that is a dominating performance. John Force, the champion, and a fitting tribute to Maynard Yanks. Force, with this victory, catapulted into the lead in the Winston Boynts chase, followed by Cruz Pedragon. Hoffman is third. Del Worsham in fourth, and Jim Epler rounds out the top five. At Houston Raceway Park, one race remains, and it is the top fuel championship of this Slick 50 Nationals. Lee Beard, the crew chief for Ed McCulloch, says, OK, let's get underway with the burnout. Well, Dan Olson, the crew chief on Rance McDaniel's TFX entry, has done the same. This could well be described as the Battle of the Fresno Boys. When they were youngsters, both McCulloch and McDaniel lived in the Fresno area. McDaniel still lives there. And this is also the battle of the veterans in top fuel racing. We talk a lot about the new blood coming into the sport, and it definitely has made its presence felt. But here in the finals, McDaniel is 52, and McCulloch is 51. These two drivers have met once before, the only time that Rance McDaniel has been in a top fuel final. That was way back in 1977, and Ed McCulloch prevailed at that race in Seattle. McDaniel and McCulloch, the finals of Top Fuel at the Slick 50 Nationals. Tremendous side-by-side -side race and won by Ed McCulloch. You can't ask for better racing than that. 4.90, the winning time for McCulloch. The losing time, 4.92 for McDaniel. Bob? Right. Lee, that's the way they should all end. It was a terrific day for the McDonald's Coca-Cola team. The crew did a superb job. We had to put a couple engines in it during the course of the day, and each one of them ran flawless. Our driver, Ed McCullough, had a superb drive today. Uh, we couldn't be happier with the performance that uh, we reached this weekend here. What can you say about your opponent in the final round? They gave you a good shot. That's an up-and-coming team. Uh, they'd be real dangerous if there was a corporate sponsor on the side of that thing. Rance McDaniel's layoff from this sport certainly has not affected his reaction time. Almost identical to a good reaction time recorded by McCulloch. So there was no advantage gained at the starting line. This one was won on pure performance by McCulloch in the near lane. And it literally was just a matter of few inches. 16 thousandths of a second separated the two at the finish line. There you see the margin of victory for the ace. You didn't get greedy. A 490, the kid wins. You're one year younger than he is. Well, you know, this is uh, really the bragging rights for Fresno. Rance and Danny and the guys have done a great job, and I'm just happy to have the, you know, the first win for the McDonald's top fuel car here right here at Houston. 
you needed an earlier start than you got last year for a championship, and it looks like you got it. Well, we're way ahead of last year. You know, we struggled big time, as everybody knows, and hopefully we hope that we could come right into Pomona at the beginning of the year and pick it up and run with it, but that wasn't the case. But here we are. We got it in winter circle, and for McDonald's and Larry Miner and Oldsmobile and all the people that uh, are involved with this, I just want to say thank you. And Lee Beard and the crew, they've done an outstanding job. We're happy for you. Thank you. And Ed McCulloch didn't do bad himself. Great driving and a great race car. The win vaults him all the way up into the second spot behind Joe Amato in the Winston chase. Doug Herbert third, Kenny Bernstein fourth, and Eddie Hill stands number five. For Steve Evans and Bob Fry, I'm Dave McClellan saying so long from Houston. The NHRA, the world's largest motorsport sanctioning body, showcasing speeds in excess of 300 miles an hour and traveling the quarter mile in less than five seconds. Championship drag racing from the NHRA. He wasn't wrong, that indeed was NHRA drag racing. It was 1993 NHRA drag racing. Unfortunately, that was last year's final. We will be showing you next year. We couldn't show it this week. But we will be showing it for you next week. 94's finals, you will see. Thank you everyone for ringing in if you spotted that, because I didn't when I told you all about it earlier on. But there you go. Next week, same time, you will catch up with the 94 finals. Okay, look out for that one.